Welcome to Jongit's Games, where today I'm bringing you my two top 10 lists for 2022. <laughs> That's a lot of twos. Uh, now, specifically, it's going to be a top 10 list for the games that came out in 2022 and a different list for the best games that I played for the first time in 2022 that came out earlier. Now, before we go into all that, I do want to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and help make content like this happen more in the future, then please go to Patreon dot com slash John gets games. As a supporter of the channel, you get access to a ton of exclusive content. First of all, there is a podcast feed where you can listen to audio versions of vlogs just like this, as well as my opinions episodes. I've made almost a hundred of these so far, talking about hundreds of different games, specifically the things I like and don't like about them, and giving updates as I continue to play them. You can also watch some of my videos early and advertisement-free, and you're supporting the channel. Now, uh, coming back to this video, as I mentioned before, I'm going to start with a top 10 list for my favorite games that came out in 2022. Also, I happened to play them in 2022. After that, I'm going to do another top 10 list for the best 10 games that I played in 2022 that were published before 2022. So realistically, I'm talking about 20 games today, and I have to say there are really good games on both of these lists. I'm going to start from 10 and go to one for each of these, and let's just begin things off with Number 10 for the games that came out in 2022. That one is Rise. Now, I'm going to start this off by saying I was sponsored to make a playthrough video for that, so take my opinions with a grain of salt. But the reason it's on this list is because this game has a really cool action selection system. Um, there's two main things about the game that people talked about. The main one was tracks. This game is a whole bunch of boards with tracks. You're moving down the tracks, you're moving around the tracks, you're doing all sorts of track stuff. But um, the thing that people didn't talk about as much is this action selection system. The way it works is you deal out action cards and event cards into a staggered row, and then once around the table, people choose one action card to go to. The farther to the right it is, the more expensive it is, but you activate every single event to the left of your token, and depending on where your opponents are, you can also get extra benefits based off of how they played. And I love this puzzle. Every single round, you put these cards out and you have to decide how much do you want to spend? How badly do you want these events? Some of the events are bad, so do you want to go over a bad event so that it hits you because that action is worth it? I think it's such a cool puzzle overall, and I also don't mind the uh, fun of going up all these tracks. I have been known to complain about having too many tracks in Euro games, but if the game is entirely tracks, then that's just fine. So yeah, the action selection system really shone through on this one. I played it a few times and it is still in our collection. Uh, moving on, we have number nine. This is Spots. Now, this is a push your luck dice game with the most adorable dog artwork that you can imagine. Uh, I don't really play that much push your luck games anymore. I used to love them like 10, 15 years ago or so. It's something I've kind of moved away from, but this has definitely kind of pulled me back a bit. The main idea here is there are actions on tiles in the middle of the table, and on your turn, you choose one of them that is active. You then do what it says, and you flip it to the deactive side. So as you go around the table, there are less of these tiles available. Eventually, there'll be one left, and you incentivize it with a little dog bone. You flip all of them up, and then you just keep going. And the actions that you choose are realistically all about rolling dice and placing them onto your dogs. Your dogs are this wonderful artwork, and it kind of integrates the pips of dice, and you're trying to fill every single spot in on the dog. But once you do that, it's not locked in. When it's your turn, instead of doing an action, you can essentially cash in all of your full dogs, flipping them over and returning their dice. Now, the problem is, if you don't do that and you push your luck with the various actions you're doing, it is possible that you will lose all of your dice, including the dice on dogs that are quote-unquote complete because all of their spots are full. Uh, but the game also is motivating you to do this because if you have completed all of your dogs, then as a bonus, you auto-complete them. So there is this tension of, do I spend a precious action Action, just cashing in my points so that I can't lose them? Or do I push my luck and try to get a free cash in by completing all of these different spots? There are a ton of different action tiles in the game. That's another reason this uh, stood out to me, because you put these in the middle of the table, but inside the box, it's just full. So every time you play this game, you use different um, sets of them, and the way they can kind of complement each other is quite interesting. I was really impressed with this game, and it's been played quite a bit. After that, we have number eight, which is Trick and Trade. Now, this is a trick-taking game that came out from Japan. I actually imported it in from Japan, 
and it is a may follow trick taking game. Now, what that means is in this game, everybody's putting one card down and then you check to see who has the best one, like most trick takers. But if I put a red card down, you could put any card from your hand down. You don't have to play a red card even if you have one in your hand. That's where the may comes in. And the idea of this game is it's all about stocks and uh, essentially trying to have the best portfolio at the end of the game. Specifically, the way it works is after you put the cards down, you check to see who played the best card of the lead suit, even though you can play off. And that card will be set off to the side and the power of that card will relate to how good that suit is at the end of the game. Now, players will also every single round be getting these stock cards. They have two different stocks on them or sometimes two of the same stock. And you just play through one hand of cards. The number of cards you have in your hand depends on the player count, but you just do that once and then the game is over and you score up. And the points for each suit in the stocks that you have in front of you are based on the strength of the cards that won various tricks. And the really interesting catch here is the stronger the card is, the less it vies for that majority. So if you find a way to win uh, with like a red three, then that is going to be huge. It's going to make red a much better company to have stocks in at the end of the game. Whereas if you win it with a 10, it might not affect the overall rankings at all. This is a fascinating game. Honestly, I don't enjoy may follow games that much anymore. I, I tend to enjoy it when it's must follow. That just works better for my brain these days. But I really like the stocks element of the game, looking around, seeing what other people have, seeing what they're trying to do. And I like the one hand nature of it. You play the whole game in like 20 to 30 minutes. You check the points and you see who did best. And you can play it again if you want. Just, you know, zero out the scores and go for it. It's just a really smart card game. All right, now for number seven, and this is Caesar with an exclamation point. Uh, I did make a playthrough video for this one on the channel. If you want to watch that, it was not sponsored. Now, this is a one or two player game. I'm pretty sure there's a one player version of it. And in this two player game, one person is Pompeii, the other person is Caesar. And it is kind of like the mechanical slash thematic sequel to Blitzkrieg. Same publisher, same designer. Now, mechanically, the way this works is you will have tiles behind your little screen, and every tile is circular with a slash in the middle and a couple numbers. When you put these tiles down, you don't put them into regions of the map. You instead put them on the border of these regions. So if it says like three and one, then you are adding three influence to one region and one to the other. And of course, you can decide where you put this and how you rotate it. And this is a really simple and really smart mechanism. Uh, you have a certain number of these tiles in front of you, and you are restricted where you can place them. If you have a sword tile, you have to put it onto a sword spot on the map. But I really like that dual uh, influence nature. I I'm not generally a huge fan of straight up uh, area majority kind of games, but the way you are influencing two different areas at the same time is fascinating. Also, each of these regions has a bonus tile in it, and the person who completes the region gets the bonus tile, and then you check to see who has the most strength there, and they get to put a kind of victory point token in there. So you are sometimes motivated to complete a region that you are not winning because the bonus tile is that good for you. And um, it's a really straightforward game as far as victory is concerned as well. You just play until somebody has put all of their little victory point tokens out onto the board because they've claimed spots or they got them from bonuses, and then the game is over. I've played this game a bunch of times so far, like five or six times at least, and it plays in about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if you're really thinking about it, and it's just really smart. I, honestly, I got rid of Blitzkrieg after I played Caesar. It's just a better game for me. Uh, I think the rules are simpler, they're more straightforward, and the mechanics of the game are more intricate and interesting than Blitzkrieg was, and I didn't see a reason to have both of those in our collection. So yeah, I really like Caesar. It's an excellent two-player game. All right, let's move on to number six, and that is Space Station Phoenix. Uh, once again, the caveat, I was paid to make a sponsored tutorial video for this one, so keep that in mind, but I played this game a few times, and it is a very interesting game. It's got a fascinating core conceit in this overall medium Euro game. Uh, that idea is that um, you are trying to build space stations. It's called Space Station Phoenix, after all, and you are doing these in orbit around Earth, and the hardest thing to do when building a space station is to get metal up there. Metal is heavy. Obviously, it's hard to get that up from the Earth. So instead, in this game, you essentially sent a bunch of ships up into, the, uh, into orbit, and you're spending the game dismantling the ships using the metal from them to build your space station, which makes a lot of sense because <laughs> you don't need to use those ships anymore. And mechanically, the way the game works is those ships are 
essentially worker placement spots. Uh, everyone has a set of them in front of them at the start of the game, and when it's your turn, you can activate other people's ships. But if you do that, you are potentially giving them some resources. I'm trying not to go into the specifics, but you are also blocking it from them being able to use it. So it can be a little bit offensive while also helping other people out. Now, as you destroy these ships, obviously the action selection spots diminish, and that gives the game a really interesting arc, where at the beginning of the game there's tons of options, and at the end of the game there are very few options because most of these action spaces have been converted into space stations, but these space stations really expand the ability for you to do a whole bunch of things. So essentially, early in the game, lots of action options, but they aren't as effective. At the end of the game, less action options, but the things that you're doing are much more effective. There's a bunch of other things going on here with like a diplomacy board and uh, aliens of a whole bunch of different types that you're trying to put down into your station. This is a medium to heavyweight game, definitely some BT decisions going on here, and I've enjoyed my plays of it. I will say I think I like it with less players than more, just because downtime, because there is a lot of things going on in this game. Okay, the next game is number five, and that is Union Station. Uh, this game was designed by a friend of mine and published by a different friend of mine, and this is a relatively small box cube rails game. Now, the reason I like this game is because unlike a lot of cube rails games where you're getting stocks in train companies and you're laying track and whatnot, this game lets you sell stocks. Now, with bigger train games like 18xx and whatnot, you can always sell stocks. Those are a, a fundamental part of those games. However, in cube rails games, frequently you can't sell stocks. And in fact, I tend to like that about many cube rails games, but the fact that you can sell stocks in Union Station is fascinating. Now, specifically, the way this game works is you are buying stocks from a river of cards along the top, and it's shuffled at the beginning of the game. And I know some people really don't like this about the game, so there is some input randomness to the game for the stocks that are available to buy based off of how that shuffle went, but I like the variety of experiences that that gives as you're playing. Also, there's different numbers of each of these stocks in the deck, so you can kind of play the odds to a certain extent. Um, now, when you sell these stocks, you get money based off of their current position on the market, and then you drop the position on the market one full row. So you have shared incentives where like I'm buying stocks that makes the, the price better. I'm putting down uh, tracks on the board, which makes the price better. And then suddenly I tank the stock and people are like, what? I thought you were working with me. And it's like, no way. I was trying to squeeze some uh, money out of that and then hurt everybody else around the table. This game has invariably always led to hilarious situations. It's not supposed to be a funny game, but there's always laughter when these moves happen, when somebody sells at a time that nobody else thought was going to happen, and people are just like, what's going on? And that can definitely put some people off uh, balance, I suppose, but this game takes like 45 minutes to play. So the fact that it's relatively short and has these really interactive, awesome moments is one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite Cube Rails games. Um, it is abstracted in a lot of ways. Like the track laying is super simple, way simpler than most uh, cube rails games. And I know some people don't necessarily like that element of the game, but I think the track laying is really just there to bolster the stock market and the selling and buying of these cards. And in my opinion, it works out quite well. I've played this uh, with the lowest player count and the highest player count, and I've enjoyed every single play of it. Okay, we're moving on to game number four, and that is Acropolis. Uh, this is a tile laying game where each player is building their own area, and the tiles that you're putting down are these triple hexagon tiles. Uh, the first thing that jumped out to me about this game is it kind of reminded me of Tuluva, which is also a tile laying game with these triple hexagon tiles. Uh, my review for Tuluva was actually the very first video I ever made for John Gets Games. That's the reason I made the channel. But the big difference here is that in Tuluva, you're building one central area, Whereas in Acropolis, you're building your own. And this is a very puzzly game about trying to get multipliers going, essentially. Uh, there are different colors on these different hexes, and the way you place them down is going to dictate not only how various things score, because like the blue hexes score very differently than the purple ones, but also the layer of those tiles in your area dictates the multiplier for just how effective those icons are at giving you victory points. When it comes to the icons that you are placing down, there's essentially two per color. There's the modifier and there's the thing that's multiplied against it. So if you just place modifiers and you don't place any of that base symbol, you're not going to get anything. And the same is true for the other way. So you're trying to kind of balance these things out. And the way you're getting these tiles is there is a central row in the middle of the table. And on your turn, you just take a tile that's available. And the further it is up, the more of these stone resources you have to spend. And you only have a certain number of these. So it does have difficult decisions because sometimes a tile might be amazing, but you might have to spend all of your stone, leaving you with zero, which means on your next turn, you have no choice. You must take the cheapest tile. And is it worth it to you? 
That is the question of this game. I played this many times at, I think, all player accounts, and I've just really enjoyed it. Uh, the scores can get a little bit crazy if you're able to make these modifiers work, especially if you get to like the third and fourth level because you're multiplying those icons uh, four times instead of one being down to the bottom. I really like the puzzle of trying to stack these things up and the give and take because as you stack up, you're covering various things. So you are hoping to make more than you're losing by covering these. And it's just a really fun tile laying puzzle uh, and one that I've enjoyed playing many times. After that, we are at number three, and this is Carnegie. Uh, now, I'm saying this a lot. I was sponsored to make a tutorial video for this, so keep that in mind. But this game really hit us hard when we first started playing it. Like, we played it once, and then we played it again, and again, and again, like three times in the first week. I say us because um, myself and my wife Jessica really liked it, as well as several other friends. Uh, in fact, we filmed a Friendly Ties podcast episode about this one because I taught it to some of my friends in that podcast, and then we just kept playing it. Now, the core of this game is pretty fascinating, actually. The way it works is on your turn, you are going to be choosing an action from a variety of options, and then everyone is going to do that specific action. And this is essentially the clock of the game. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, there are going to be 20 turns throughout the game, or 20 action activations. And a big part of this game is trying to set yourself up so that when your opponent does that action, you can do something about it. And also, a big part of the game is trying to do actions that help you and don't help your opponents. Sometimes, in really drastic situations, you might do an action that you can't do anything for because your opponents also can't do anything for it yet, and you can tell they're building up towards a big activation of that. So by doing that essentially zero-sum situation, you are still getting an advantage because you are essentially knocking them off of their rhythm. Now, another thing I really like about this game is that it doesn't feel like anything else that I've played. It's a Euro game, and it looks like a Euro game if you walk by the table. But mechanically, the way it works is you have a business in front of you. You're going to be moving around workers to various tiles. There's kind of a puzzle going on there. And when you do certain actions, you actually put these um, workers out onto the board, the map of the United States, and they stay out there until you can pull them back. And it's the pulling back where things get fascinating. Now, going back to that board where you are activating these different things, one of the uh, options as you are doing this is pulling back these workers from specific regions. So again, you might activate to pull back workers from a region that's empty, knowing your opponent is about to try and go there, making it harder for them to actually get that benefit. Because as they come back, they activate an engine in front of you that gets better throughout the game. So you are trying to balance things out to get the right tiles to move your workers around to get them onto the boards so that you can pull them off of the board to get that income. If you just hang out in your own little business, you're not going to win the game. You have to send them out and bring them back. And that overall system mixed with everybody doing the same actions and being potentially really mean about it makes for a fascinating game that always takes about the same amount of time to play because if you have more players, that just means you're choosing what the action is less often, but it's still going to be 20 actions every single game. A four-player game will take a bit longer than a two-player game, but in general, it's a a pretty uh, similar um, uh, time frame, and this is just a meaty game that we really enjoyed. I haven't played it in a little while, and talking about it right now makes me feel like I wouldn't mind cracking that one open again. Okay, we've reached game number two for 2022, and that one is Dinosaur Gage. And this is a cube rails game about dinosaur uh, magnates, <laughs> essentially. Um, you are making dinosaur uh, train companies putting down track. You, there are dinosaur ferry lines and dinosaur airlines. The, the art is amazing in this game, and it is a cube rails game, but in addition to the wonderful theming of it, having silly dinosaurs instead of like a, a stuffy, bland-looking train game, is that this game is essentially simulating an economy in a way that I find fascinating. I've played this game several times now, and what I mean by that is there is some pick up and deliver with the train companies. You're putting down track and you're trying to deliver things from one spot to the other. But there's also factories. You can invest in stocks for these factories and then produce at the factories to make things that go onto the board that train companies will want to deliver to get those points. So what you want to do is maybe have stocks in a train company and stocks in a factory and have that factory make the good, which helps your stocks, and then have your train company move that good, which helps your different stocks. So the portfolio nature of this game is fascinating. It's not just everybody has stocks and trains. You might go through the entire game and have like one stock in a train and focus entirely on factory production or ferries. Uh, this is a way that you can get things across the water on the map. But as the game goes on, the water is drying up. Every single turn, you're putting down a tile that makes a certain spot essentially not be water anymore. So the ferries get worse throughout the game. And there's also airlines, which um, are sometimes a complete non-factor in the game. And sometimes they absolutely blow the game wide open because they are very multiplicative and it's hard to get that multiplier going. But if you do, 
oh my gosh, it's worth so much money. So again, the central idea why I like this game so much is that overall uh, linked together economy where you can buy stocks in all of these different things. So you have incentives for these different things and you're trying to make this economy work, to actually make the stuff that's going to get transported across the thing. If you lay track with your train company across the water, then that makes the ferries better and you might have stocks in those ferries. At least you hope you do if you're making those stocks better. And it's just a fascinating ecosystem of a game. Um, it feels like a little bit of a lot the first time you play it, like from a rules perspective, because there's all these different modules. But the rules for each of these things are printed on the board. It's a gorgeous looking game and it's one that I've really enjoyed playing. I, my only caveat, I suppose, is I think it's better with three or four players. I have played it at five and you just don't take enough turns, I think, to really feel the overall uh, uh, integrated nature of the game. It's not bad at five for sure, but I do think I prefer it at three and four. All right, it's time for my favorite game that was published in 2022, and that is John Company 2nd Edition. Now, again, this is when the game is published, not necessarily when I played it. I don't think I played this one in 2022, but I played this one a bunch, and it is phenomenal. In my opinion, the best game from that year that I've played. And the reason for that is because it's a really intricate game, but it is also an amazing simulation-type shared incentive game to a certain extent. There are stocks, but everybody is running the um, British East India Company, which is a terrible company doing terrible things in India, trying to make money. And one of the reasons I like this game so much is because it puts you in a situation where mechanically the incentives make you feel like you should do terrible things. It tries to put you in the mindset of these terrible people. And obviously, they should not be going to war so that you can buy a mansion back home. But as you're playing the game, <laughs> you're thinking, well, I don't know, that mansion is pretty nice. You know, as a human, I would never actually do that. But in the game, it's just interesting to see how the incentives push and pull you around. Um, in this game, again, everybody is running the same company, but it is a competitive game. You're trying to have the most prestige at the end of the game. All you care about is what people think about you back in London and the things that you're doing in India are all about trying to affect that, essentially. And as you're playing the game, you're going to control various roles based off of your family members. So you might be in charge of the shipping and you might also be the president of, uh, of Madras. And then later on, that presidency might go away because they retire and suddenly you're actually in charge of the uh, military affairs. And it's going to change as the game goes on. And there's a lot of negotiation in this game. I'm not generally a huge fan of a ton of negotiation. Also, there's a lot of randomness in the game, tons of dice rolls, and I'm not usually a fan of roll to resolve, which absolutely happens in this game. So there's a lot of reasons why I maybe should not like this game, but I think the way all these things came together to make a almost role-playing game-esque simulation type situation just worked for me. Every single time that I've played this game, I've really enjoyed the overall experience, the arc of the game. Sometimes India fights back and destroys John Company. That happened once and I won the game because, you know, in the ashes of this company that was destroyed, I still had the most prestige based off of various things because maybe I didn't have stocks in the company in that game and other people did and so they lost value from those stocks. Um, so you could kind of see the arc of the game, see how things go, but sometimes the events just happen and totally knock things off course as well. And yeah, something magical about this game happens where all these things I usually don't like. Also, with the play length, this game takes um, on the short end like three hours and at the long end like eight hours. Uh, and if it's a three-hour game, that's probably because the company died <laughs> in like the third or fourth round. Um, it's a really long game with a ton of role to resolve and a ton of negotiation and a theme that makes you incentivized to do awful things. All these things just stir together in a pot to make a game that has just absolutely blown me away. I played it, I think, five times now, and I'm very much looking forward to playing this one more. Um, by the way, we did make a full playthrough. Uh, that was myself, Matt, and uh, Dave, a three-player playthrough. We filmed it right over here. So if you're curious to learn more about that, you can watch some of that video. It's a long video because it's a long game, but it was a fascinating play of the game, and I think it did a good job of teaching the game as it was played and showing you the various vibes that go on with it. So yeah, uh, I could potentially talk about John Company for a lot longer, specifically the second edition, that is. The first edition is quite different, and I actually picked up a cheap copy of it, and I have not had a chance to play it yet. So I am hoping to make that happen at some point in the future to see how I feel between these two versions of this game. All right, that is my top 10 list for games that were published in 2022, but this video is only half over because I played a lot of great games for the first time in 2022 that came out earlier because I just never got around to playing them or I never heard of them before and suddenly they just kind of rock my world. So let's jump right into that top 10 list with number 10, and that is Nikosu Dice. This is a trick-taking game that came out in 2016. I'd never heard of it until a couple of years ago. And the main gimmick of the game, I suppose, is the fact that there are dice and 
good cards. So this is a must-follow trick-taking game. So if I play a blue card and you have a blue card, you have to play it. But maybe you don't have a blue card, but you have a blue die. Well, dice are actually cards in this game. So that means you'd be forced to play that blue die because you don't have any blue cards in your hand. And of course, you can see the dice that everybody has in front of you. In fact, at the start of each hand, you do a dice draft. You roll all these dice and then people uh, get some of the dice randomly and then they pick dice over and over again uh, after you have a hand of cards. So when you start the actual trick play, you have a split hand uh, with dice that are functionally cards and then cards in your hand. People can't see the cards, but people can see those dice. And then you start doing the trick play. And this game is all about exactly hitting your bid. And you'll notice I haven't mentioned calling your bid. And that's because these dice are also your bid. Once you go down to a single die, then the pip values of that die turn into your bid. And that is no longer a card. So that means you are playing dice as cards. But as you place them, you are restricting the number of uh, tricks that you think you are going to win. And if you are in a situation where you have a five and a two, and you have four tricks, and you're aiming for that five, but then somebody leads a color that forces you to play that five, suddenly your bid is two, and you've gone way over, and you're not going to be getting points in this round. So it is a fascinating totally brain crunchy puzzle trying to work yourself in a situation to have the right die for the number of tricks that you win and for looking at your opponents and trying to find ways to break them seeing the dice that they have and force them to make their bid be something that they can't make this is a game that a lot of people have liked i will say at five players it's not amazing i would definitely not play it at five again in the future because this is a thinky game it is not a breezy throw cards down type of trick taker you are considering so many different factors and i really enjoy that consideration but it's also, uh, again, a game that I don't necessarily throw down on the table all the time because of that really thinky nature to it. Okay, number nine is The Emerald Flame. This came out in 2021, so just before 22. And this is a fully cooperative kind of escape room type game, although it isn't an escape room. It is a puzzle solving game that brings you through an overall narrative. It's a big box and inside of it, there's a bunch of different types of puzzles. Uh, some of these puzzles involve folding things or cutting things or writing things down or looking at a map or aligning things to various spots or doing various other consumable type things. I'm trying not to spoil it. And also it's been a little while since I played, so I don't remember all the specifics, but this is a game that Jessica and I played all the way through, I think in about three sittings. Um, and each of those sittings was like, 60 to 90 minutes, something like that. And we really enjoyed it from beginning to end. I won't say that every puzzle is brilliant, but I will say that the worst puzzles were fine and the best puzzles were super cool. <laughs> that is just being like, whoa, that's so cool, figuring all this kind of stuff out. It's just, uh, it looks great, like from an art perspective and from a component perspective. And it was just a really fascinating cooperative puzzle type experience that I highly recommend. Also inside the box, it comes with a recharge pack so that all the things that are destroyed, you can just throw those away and then open the recharge pack, put them where they should go, and you can move the box onto somebody else. So this big box can be used multiple times with the minimal amount of waste. And I really like that as a, a thing that's built in to this overall game. Again, if you like exit games or unlock games or that kind of thing, I would definitely give the Emerald Flame a look. We were really impressed by it. Okay, we now have game number seven, and this is Nana, or Trios. It just got republished under a different name. This game also came out in 2021, so just before I played it. And this is a, it almost seems like a kid's game, but it's it's one over every single person I played it with. It is a memory game, and I do not enjoy memory that much, but it also has some kind of deduction elements. The way it works is you're going to deal out um, all these cards to the various players, and then everyone is going to sort their hand from lowest to highest, hiding it from everybody else. There's also some cards face down in the middle of the table, and when it's your turn, you simply flip over a card. It could be a card in the middle of the table, or you could look across the table and say, so-and-so, um, show your highest card or your lowest card. You can only do highest or lowest. They reveal a card, or you flip something from the middle, and then you reveal another card. If the two cards revealed match, then you can reveal a third card. And if all three of those match, congratulations, you score those. And if you do that three times, you win. You can also win if you do it two times in certain conditions, and you just straight up win if you manage to do this with the three sevens. Of course, because seven is in the middle of the range. I think the range is one to 
12, 13, something like that. So it's hard to actually get to the sevens because, again, you can only force people to reveal the highest or lowest card, and sevens are usually nestled there in the middle. Of course, if you ask somebody to reveal a card or you flip one in the middle of the table and it does not match, then your turn is over, you flip everything face down again, that card goes back into people's hands, and the next person goes. So you are constantly engaged in this game, even when it's not your turn, because you want to see what other people are flipping over and to remember what went where based off of the cards that you have in your hand. And again, it feels like a kid's game with this kind of memory elements, and I have played this one with kids, and they have loved it, but I've also played this numerous times with, you know, adults around the table, and we are just laughing, having a great time, playing it multiple times back to back, because it takes between 10 and maybe 25 minutes to play, depending on how quickly somebody wins. Also, the art in my version, Nana, is absolutely adorable. I've seen the art for Trios, and it looks fine, but I, I very much prefer my version with the super cute animals and whatnot uh, that are on all these cards. This game has been a hit, uh, again, in particular when I played it with kids, but also with uh, just a bunch of people, as far as it being like a game you play when you're waiting for other people to show up, or between games where you're waiting for somebody to finish something. It it's just really works. Also, if you <laughs> decide to stop it in the middle, it's not the end of the world because you've probably only been playing for like 10 minutes. Anyway, I highly recommend this game. It's been a lot of fun. Next up, we have game number seven, and this is Wiener Walzer. It came out in 2016, which honestly surprises me because this feels like a game that would have come out in like 2002. Now, this is a Reiner Kinesia design, and I'd never heard of it before, but my friend Anastasia um, got it for cheap um, somehow and asked me to try it out, and I played it a couple of times two-player and one time three players, and I was blown away by how much I enjoyed it at two. Now, mechanically, the way this game works is you have a board in the middle of the table, and you seed it with a whole bunch of food, and and uh, I guess not just food, cigars and champagne and crostinis and all that kind of stuff. And then when it's your turn, you're going to be putting down people onto the board, taking the tile that was there, the cigars or the champagne or whatnot, and you put that in front of you. And you're trying to do set collection, having multiple sets, hypothetically, of different types of these various things you can smoke and eat and whatnot. But then the tiles that you put out on the board are going to dance with each other, hypothetically. Um, now, this is where it feels a little bit older than it necessarily is because it has like men dancing with women, although you could totally play this with men dancing with men specifically and whatnot. Realistically, it's kind of an A, B situation where where A's dance with B's, and when the dance happens, you both get points based off of the higher value on there. So if you manage to get a one to dance with a five, then you both get five points. And in a two-player game, that could be great. Like if you put the five down and I dance with it with a one, then I just got five points off of your five-point tile, meaning you didn't net anything on me, and I did that with one of my lower point tiles. And this gets really puzzly, but the dancing only happens once a tile is fully surrounded. So this is just a fascinating puzzle, trying to consider what tiles you want to take from the board, which is going to dictate the position where you go to dance, because you want these set collections for those points, but also trying to set things up so that you can force your opponent to potentially have to lock something out when they don't want to, or maybe get a bunch of value from their high value uh, tiles when they weren't expecting it. It was just a surprisingly thinky game, one I really enjoyed, even though the <laughs> specific theming of it did not work out super well for me. I, I kind of wish there was a different theme that would make this uh, happen just as well, because mechanically, it's really fun. I, I did enjoy my two-player game more than my three-player game, although I don't want to write that off. It plays up to five, and I'm not sitting here saying this is a two-player only game. That's just been my experience, and I have heard that it's fun with like four players and whatnot because the shared incentives come into play because you are dancing with one player versus another player, and that means you two are getting points, but those people aren't. I think there's a lot to consider here, especially when you have more than two players, even though, from my experience, it is very fun at two. Okay, it's now time for game number six, and this is Oasis, and this is an old game. It came out in 2004. I only learned about it, I think, the year that I played it, specifically because I heard it on the Hidden Gems podcast. They talk about older games or games you've never heard of before, and this was on there, and they really liked it. It sounded fascinating to me, so I bought it, and I played this so many times now, <laughs> like six, seven, eight times, something like that. Um, we've been playing it as recently as a month ago, but I also played it a bunch in 2022. And the idea of this game is really strange. Everybody gets a deck of cards that they can't look at. And then at the start of each round, players in order are going to reveal cards blind from the top of their deck, either one, two, or three cards. And then you move on to the next person. And once everybody has revealed one to three cards, then you go in an order taking cards and getting the benefits of those, and that is going to dictate the new player order. So if I'm the first player and I take the cards that are in front of you, I give you the first player token. So that means you'll be first player in the next round, and going early can be very good in this game. Also, if you're the first player, you get an extra bonus. So what that means is you have this sort of push-your-luck system where you're trying to reveal cards that are good for your opponents, 
but it's a competitive game. So you don't want it to be too good for your opponents, but you're trying to lure specific players with higher uh, turn order tokens to take your cards. But also, you don't want to run out of cards, because after putting these cards out, you draw cards based off of the number of cards you played. The more cards you play, the less you draw. So you can deplete your deck going down to like one card, which means in the next round, you have very little flexibility with the number of cards you can play, which means you might reveal a really sad lot of cards, which means you're not going to be in a good position to take good cards in the next round. Then the actions that you take are essentially uh, multiplicative. You either put tokens on the board or you take a modifier token and put it in front of you. And at the end of the game, you're going to multiply all of those things on the board with your modifiers. And I think there's like four or five different things that you are multiplying together, and then you get points for that. And again, you get the modifiers and you put things on the board based off of the cards that you take from other people. It's just a weird game that, in my opinion, plays best with five. I've enjoyed it with four, but having more people just means there's more lots for people to take. And it just continues to amaze me how well this system works, considering you are blindly drawing cards that will potentially help other people. Uh, there have definitely been moments where I get kind of annoyed, like turn after turn, I reveal terrible cards. The last time that happened, though, I came in second and I was actually close to actually winning it. So it's like, okay, well, I guess I shouldn't have complained so much. There is definitely room for smart play and uh, trying to, you know, get over that essentially randomness that can happen in the game. It's a really smart game and I highly recommend people give it a chance if they have the opportunity. Next up, we have game number five, and it came out in 2005. This is Square on Sale. Um, also, obviously, a very old game. And this is a game that I learned about, I think actually in like 2021, but I didn't end up playing it until 2022. And at a high level, this game is essentially multiplayer Othello, uh, as in where you put tokens on the board, and if you have a token on each end, you flip all the ones in between. But every time you put a token on the board, there is a multi-turn auction. <laughs> so it's auctions to put tiles on the board, and it is bonkers. I generally don't love auctions, but I, it really works in this game. This is just a fascinating experience because... As you are putting these tiles down onto the board, you are getting more and more points based off of the stacking. You don't remove things, you just stack on top. And again, you can see this multiple turns ahead. If you start an auction to place on one specific spot, that would be great for you. It connects with another one. There's three spots in the middle that you would cover up. Well, it has to come back around to you and again, two full times with you winning that auction. And of course, people can outbid you as it's going. So there are these really long-term auctions, but on players' turns, they can start new auctions or increase the bid on other auctions. So it becomes this crazy, like, spinning plates game where there's auctions all over the place happening at various times, and there are situations where this auction is about to happen and it would be terrible for you, so you outbid that thing, but that means you're not paying attention to another auction that's also going to be terrible for you. It is an experience. I don't think this this is um, going to be everyone's type of game, but people who enjoy odd mechanics in board games should definitely try to play this game at least once. You might bounce off of it, but it is such a fascinating thing that totally works. It's one of those things where it's like, I can't believe this is working, but it absolutely does. I played it like five or six times now, uh, just once with a physical copy that I have, and I really enjoyed that play of it as well. This is the game that I essentially want to teach every single one of my friends at least once. And uh, there's still a bunch of my friends who have not tried it yet. So me talking about it now makes me realize I should get on that. Okay, we are at game number four, and this is Hellas. It came out in 2016, and it was designed by Stefan Dora. And I had never heard about this game before, but Anastasia bought a copy, uh, brought it over, and we played it, and we both fell in love with it. In fact, we have filmed a full playthrough video of this game. So if you're curious about it, then search John Gets Games Hellas uh, playthrough, maybe, and you should be able to find it. Now, the reason I like this game is because it is incredibly mean, and it also has some kind of hidden shared incentives going on. I've played this at two, three, and four. I think I probably prefer it at three, although I've enjoyed it at all of these counts. Now, the way the shared incentives works is you have this uh, hexagonal grid in the middle of the table, and there are mines that are going to be placed onto the board. And when it is your turn, you're going to be doing some essentially worker placement onto various actions, and many of these actions let you build little houses that go onto the board, and these actions also let your opponents place even when it's not their turn. So you get to do stuff when it's not your turn often, and whenever there is a essentially mining action, which somebody makes happen by doing an action, all of the mines will make marble for everyone that's adjacent to it. And I might have two houses next to a marble mine where you have one, so I'm going to get twice as much marble from that mine as you will, but maybe a third player also has two, and so we're kind of equal and you're not, so there's some shared stuff going on here. And whenever you do that mining action, you have to pay attention to see, are you actually putting yourself at a disadvantage? Are you giving other people more marble than you are getting? 
And is that okay? Maybe you do that because you are out of marble and you desperately need marble anyway, even if it's going to help other people. So this game is very much about uh, positional awareness. It's a very mean game from a blocking perspective. You're trying to make big clusters and you get uh, points for doing a variety of little things that are not particularly complicated, but they, you definitely need to pay attention to them. But a big part of the game is paying attention to these mines. And as you put new mines out, you are going to essentially make old mines worse or just kill them entirely. So those two houses you had next to that amazing mine now do nothing for you later on in the game because the mines are way over there now. So it has this interesting flow where the mines kind of move around and players are chasing those mines to try and get the marble from it while also trying to connect everything up and while also giving their opponents opportunities to do stuff on their turn. You just, you're doing stuff all the time, even when it's not your turn, because so many of the actions involve everybody getting to put something down on the table. I've been really impressed with this game. It's just smart from a uh, denying things perspective and smart from a trying to get into places where other people uh, are trying to block you out of to get those resources or just to score points. It is a deceptively fun game, in my opinion. And when I first looked at it, it looked fine, but it absolutely blew me away the first time I played it. And I've really enjoyed it every single time since. Again, at four players, Players, it's pretty chaotic because so much can happen between your actual main turns versus a two-player game being very strategic overall, and it is fun at all of those counts. Okay, we are at game number three, and this is Sealand, and it came out in 2010. I had never heard about this game until a friend of mine, Anastasia, um, bought a copy, brought it over, we played it, and again, just like Hellas, we fell in love with it. This is a game all about trying to get points from windmills that are placed out onto a big hexagonal board. And it's very different from Hellas, even though it kind of sounds like it is right now, because there is this fascinating economy double rondelle system. So up in the top left corner of the board, there's an outer rondelle of coins and an inner rondelle of tiles that you put down onto the board. When it's your turn, you get to move your token around this outer rondelle based off of where these coins are. I'm not going to go into the specifics of this in this top 10 list, but just trust me that the way this works is fascinating because the further you go around that rondelle, the less flexibility you have on future turns. However, the more you can move the inner rondelle to get to that specific tile that's amazing for you to put down onto the map. So you could maybe move really slowly on the outer rondelle and have lots of options and try to constrain the options of your opponents or just jump right to the end and just deal with the consequences of those actions. And sometimes it fluctuates from uh, the front to the back based off of the decisions people are making. Then when it comes to the tiles out on the board, they are going to give victory points to the windmills that are adjacent to them. And it's very possible, in fact, very frequent, where you might put a tile down that's adjacent to multiple windmills. And that means multiple windmills can get that benefit. So you are sharing these incentives again. And this game is surprisingly good at two. Uh, I've enjoyed it at three and four players, honestly, every time I played Sealand. I've absolutely loved this experience. Uh, we've been talking about maybe making a playthrough video for it. It hasn't happened just yet. I suppose I should mention that we did film a Friendly Ties podcast episode about this uh, with me, Anastasia, and our friend Nick. So if you want to learn more about it, you can check that out because this game is unassuming but brilliant at its core. Uh, the way it works at two players is surprisingly mean, uh, trying to block things out and put windmills next to other windmills, even though it's bad for both players, it's worse for specific people. There are also these... Uh, governor tokens that get flipped up at certain points in the game and they give you bonus points if you score a windmill really well but they also give you negative points if you don't score that windmill well and if you don't score it and you get those negative points they move to another windmill which could be an opponent or it could be yours depending on the proximity so bouncing these uh governors or mayors or whatever around is a huge part of the game it can be really funny and also devastating based off of how they can go and i just love this communal tile laying experience where you're sharing the tiles and also sharing those double rondelles working off each other. This game absolutely blew me away. It's one that I hadn't heard anybody else really talking about. I think it flew under a lot of people's radar, but I'm here to tell you this is an excellent game. All right, it's time for game number two, and this is Spectaculum. It came out in 2012, and this is a cube rails game designed by Reiner Kinesia, and it is so good. Um, I have to admit, I only know about this game because a viewer on John Gets Games mentioned it in a comment. They said, hey, by the way, I think you'd like this game based off what you're saying. I'd never heard of it before. I bought a copy, and they were so right. Um, now, this game is all about putting tracks down onto a board, although thematically, 
it's carnivals and you're traveling, carnival, whatever. The theme doesn't really matter. But the way it works is at the end of every turn, you're going to draw three random tokens out of the bag, keep them hidden, and at the start of your next turn, you will be forced to place these tokens as track onto the board. But you also get two other actions that you can do before or after you lay this track. And the actions are simple. You either buy stock for the value of that uh, carnival <laughs> train company right now, or you sell stock and get money back equal to the value of that. And as you're putting these train tokens down, you might be increasing the value or decreasing the value or causing a quote unquote dividend to happen where everyone with stocks gets money from the bank or a sickness, uh, which is a penalty where everyone has to lose money based off of the stocks that they have. And I love this puzzle. It's just fascinating to think about the tiles that you randomly drew. It does have some input randomness here, but as far as the output is concerned, you have tons of options. And let's say you have a couple of reds and you might want to buy red and the red tracks on the board are close to some positives. Maybe you spend an action to buy red and then put those red tracks down, increasing the price of red. So the next time somebody buys it, it's going to cost three or four more. Um, or maybe the inverse is true and you have some red and you could make red really bad. So you might sell those red and then drop those tokens down, tanking the price of red in the process so that it's bad for everybody else around the table. Now, I mentioned earlier in this video that selling stocks is not necessarily my favorite thing in cube rails, but it works so well in this game in particular because you will run out of money if you just buy, 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 buy. You have to sell stocks at the right moment to get the liquidity to buy more stocks in this game. And at the very end of the game, you essentially sell all of your stocks for their value, and then whoever has the most money wins. So every time you sell in the middle of the game, you're hypothetically giving up an action that you didn't necessarily need to do, but maybe you're selling at the top right before the price is going to get really bad. Or again, maybe you just desperately need some money. If you're forced to pay a penalty, but you don't have enough money behind your screen, you actually are forced to sell stocks at half their value to get the money to pay that penalty. And that is a big incentive in this game, trying to make sure you are not in a situation where you could get wrecked by one of these things happening. And of course, if you are, then that just means you were too greedy and you had to play things around. Um, much like many of these things I've said today, uh, we did film a playthrough video for this one, me and Anastasia, and it plays very well at two. That was a two player playthrough. It shows the game off really well. We had a blast with it. I've enjoyed this at two, three, and four. It's excellent at all of those player counts. This is one of my favorite Cube Rails games, uh, which is a little surprising considering it does have input randomness of taking those tiles. But again, in my opinion, you pretty much always have good, interesting things to do with those tiles as you're playing. And I've never had a bad play of this. It's just an exceptional game. Okay, it's time for the last game I'm talking about today, the number one not 22 game that I played in 2022, and that's Hachi Train. And it couldn't not be Hachi Train. This is a uh, climbing shedding card game that I've played over 30 times. <laughs> I looked at BGG and I'm, I have almost twice as many plays as the next person. So as far as people who log plays on BGG, I have the most plays in this game. It's a really simple game and it is in many ways compared to Scout. Um, in this game, there are eight different values, one to eight. You get a random hand of cards with eight in there and you can't rearrange them much like Scout. And then you are playing these cards. You're trying to just get rid of your cards as quickly as you can. And the way it works is you're just playing sets. There's no runs like three, four, five. But if you play a seven, I could beat it with an eight or I could beat it with two ones or I could beat it with four fours. You essentially escalate. And if I play four fours, somebody could beat that with four fives or maybe five ones. And in the deck, there are a number of these cards equal to the players around the table. Now, the real catch and the reason this game is just brilliant and why it's been played over and over and over again in our group is because every time you beat previous cards, you have to take them back into your hand. So again, let's say there are four fours out there and you beat it with four sixes. You have to take those four fours and put them back into your hand, but you can decide where they go. So if you don't have any fours in your hand, you just made your hand worse. You had four sixes and now you had four fours. Four is a worse number than six. So you have to make sure that was the right thing to do. But if you already had a four, now you have five fours or maybe you have six fours and that is stronger and you can drop that down the next time it comes back around to you. Now, in this game, there is a draw deck and the first... I think eight times or so people pass. They have to draw a card from the top. And these cards are split cards. They're either a one or a two or a three or a four. And you can decide what they are when you immediately play them. And this adds a lot of um, thinkiness, I guess, to the game. I don't want to overstate the thinkiness. This is a very streamlined, straightforward game in a lot of ways. But it does give you some wrinkles to consider with where you're going to be putting it. And it lets you make even bigger sets than you might think you would normally be able to. And at the end, the idea of this game is only one person is going to lose the hand. So I said you want to get rid of your cards as fast as possible. 
Technically, you just want to make sure you are not the last person with cards. The second to last person to play all their cards functionally gets the same amount of uh, points as the first person to play all their cards because the only ramification of a hand is the one person who didn't play all their cards loses $100 million. <laughs> it's just so funny. You get this card at the beginning of the game. It says $200 million on it for trains. And uh, the first time you're the last person, you flip it over, it goes down to 10. And if you flip over again, then you're out. And in fact, that ends the game. You lose everybody else wins. So it has this really <laughs> fun, odd situation where only one person loses. It's not like, oh, one person wins. It's just one person loses every hand and one person loses the overall game. So if you're playing five players, that's four winners and one loser. I know this rubs a lot of people wrong, but it works so well for the situations that I played it. And that is just leaning back, playing cards with friends, maybe drinking a beer, just low key fun card playing times. This is not the deepest game out there. Scout is definitely a thinkier, deeper game overall, but I played this game, you know, more than twice as many times as I played Scout because it's just so easy to keep playing at the table. The last time I played this, myself and some friends, we played five games in a row, just boom, 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 boom. We played for like two and a half hours straight because every time we finished a game, we're like, let's do it again because we're just having a great time hanging out chucking cards around. There is a big benefit to that when it comes to card games. A lot of card games are thinky, crunchy, you're considering all these things. Hachi Train is not like that. It's a breezy, fun experience where you're laughing and groaning and you're trying to just not be the last person to play all your cards. So even if there's card draw luck, which there is, and you get an amazing hand, you got essentially the same amount of benefit as the person who had a terrible hand, but they're not the last person to go out. And I just really like how all these things have bounced together. Honestly, again, I've just had so much fun playing this over and over again with my group. Some people have bounced off it a little bit because they think it's too light and not interesting enough. And I understand that perspective on it. There are some times when I'm not feeling like playing Hachi Train, I'd like to play something crunchier, but in the right uh, time, which happens somewhat frequently for me, this is like the perfect card game to play. And it's the number one game that I played in 2020. 2022 that wasn't published in 2022. I forgot to mention it was published one year earlier in 2021. Um, also, I'm terribly sorry to say it's impossible to buy this game that I've been raving about, but there is a silver lining. Um, Hachi Train is super sold out. It will probably never be published again. You probably can't get a copy of it, but this game called Nana Tori Dori was published a year later, the same designer, and it has a different rule set. It's, a, it's more relaxed. It's even easier, even breezier, and I don't like it as much because of that, but the way the components work, you can essentially play Hachi Train with that. In fact, I've put a Tori Train variant up on BGG in the forums. You can look there and and you can play a game that's like 90% the same as Hachi Train with Nana Tori Dori. Nana Tori Dori has beautiful artwork with a bunch of birds on it. It's very easy to get a copy of. So if this sounds interesting to you, then grab a copy of that. Um, try it with the rules that's written, or I recommend trying it with my variant, and I think you'll probably have an even better time with it. These are just really fun card games. Okay, that is going to bring this top 10 plus 10 video to a close. Talking about 20 games is quite a bit. Um, it's always hard with these figuring out how much to talk about a game because I know I'm talking about 20, but I also don't want to breeze through them too quickly. Um, if you have thoughts about any of these games or questions about any of them, then please leave a comment on this uh, video. I also want to point out Every single uh, game that I talked about today has been talked about once or more times in the opinions episodes that I film as exclusives to the Patreon supporters of this channel. So if you'd like to hear me talk for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes about some of these games, depending on how many times I've covered them, you can gain access to that by supporting the channel, and I'd really appreciate it. All right, that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.